Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. Glad you could join me. And uh, hey, Happy New Year again. Hope you're well and are su- still hunting and celebrating by hunting. Uh, we're going to go off the reservation today a little bit on the podcast uh, because we have an exclusive interview that I conducted with the founder of the Meat Eater Empire, Steve Ranella was working on a cover story for one of the magazines I write for and thought uh, at the end of this thing, when I pulled it all together, I realized you might enjoy hearing from Steve as well. We go a little bit down uh, a whole bunch of rabbit holes. We're talking everything from conservation to corporations and a little bit of everything in between. Not as much bird hunting in there, but I think you'll enjoy learning from Steve what motivates him, why he does what he does, where that organization is going. You're probably a fan of the Meat Eater organization and maybe one of their other podcasts or their TV show or whatever. And here's your chance to to kind of get it from the source. So uh, we'll be moving on to that. Like I said, we're going off script a little bit, so we will be skipping some of our regular features for this one. But you will get those back in the next one, so don't worry at all about the Upland Nation podcast taking care of you and you and you and everybody else in the in the world of birds, dogs, and target shooting. It's all made possible by Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products, Pointer Shotguns, Mid-Valley Clays and Shooting School, True Lock Choke Tubes, and FindBirdHuntingSpots.com. And let's start by thanking some of them, Mid-Valley Clays and Shooting School. If you want to learn more about all the things they offer, go to MidValleyClays.com. If you're shopping for a new shotgun because Santa Claus left you a lump of coal in your stocking or maybe a wad of cash, well, they've got a great online store. So go to the website midvalleyclays.com click on the shotguns tab scroll down to the online store and then shop everything from beretta blazer browning garini Kriegoff, rizzini fabarn fair and siren it's all at midvalleyclays.com and our friends at truelockjokes Dot com want to remind you that even if you did get a new shotgun for Christmas, maybe the first thing you should do besides cleaning it carefully and then testing it is put some aftermarket choke tubes in there. They will improve your shooting immediately. Take my word for it. And if you need more than that, well, all you got to do is look at the page with all the pattern papers on it. Yeah, it will. My best guess is you'll add one bird per trip. If you've got good choke tubes that are creating great patterns for you, learn more about all of that. And remember, there's a lifetime warranty, satisfaction guarantee. Learn more at Truelock Chokes, T-R-U-L-O-C-K, truelockchokes.com. Now let's get to that interview with meat eater, Steve Ranella. How you been? Oh, I've been doing, doing all right, you? Uh, just off two days on the Deschutes River. So uh, probably saw 40 uh, bighorns on the opposite oh. side of the bank from me. You were fishing, I presume? Yeah, yeah, or trying to fish. Only got a few, got a few touches, but nothing worth getting excited about. But it was a good float. Like steelhead? Uh, this time of year, it's all rainbows. Oh, I got you. Yeah. I don't have the patience for steelhead anyway. You know, they, there's a reason they call it the fish of a thousand casts. Well, that's what they call muskies. That's right. They do, yeah. Probably a musky f- fisherman came out here and said, man, this is just as bad. Uh, I grew up in Michigan, and we used to catch, you know, the transplants. Yeah, more, yeah. More steelhead in a day than people that live in native steelhead water catching a lifetime <laughs> oh i know i've seen pictures of some of those streams first off there's about a thousand uh, you know anglers and then there's yeah there are they have to f- be careful where they step there's so many fish moving out of those little tiny tributaries isn't there yeah it was great we used to catch a lot of fish we'd start in november and 
stay on until June, you know. Wow. Well, yeah. well, good on you. I know we have a limited amount of time, and I just want yeah. to wrap wrap up a few things. And uh, really enjoying this, I'm 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 actually drafting this piece as we speak. So, let's put a little bit of cherry on top of the whipped cream on top of the ice cream that's on top of the cake, uh, which has icing on all sides. Um. Uh, let's see. Where are we? Here we go. Um, so we've talked about a lot of stuff, covered a lot of stuff. So here's here are a few more things, kind of potluck. Um, what do you think the biggest challenge has been getting to where Meat Eater is today? Okay. Oh, did I lose you? No, I'm, I'm still here. Oh, okay. Uh, what do you mean by that? I, I, I guess, I mean personally you know if if you're the guy and you are um you know you've gone from a, a pretty good writer you know and a book author and and that sort of thing and and now here you are as you know a a, a digital phenomenon for lack of a better term what has that done or how has that affected you i can't even begin i, I don't know yeah. um any if you went in any 10 year gap in life, this is probably true for a lot of people. If you'd have asked me when I was 20 to map out where I'd be when I was 30, I would have never even come close. Yeah. If you'd have asked me to do it when I was 30 about being 40, I would have never have come close. Uh, I, I don't, I, I don't have any expectations about what I'll be doing down the road. Um, I, I'm not career wise. I'm, I'm like, I, I'm not motivated by anything distant. It's just, I just, I generally am doing the thing that makes the most sense to me in the moment. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so I don't like, I, I don't ever, I, never think like oh wow that's weird that that happened um <laughs> i went to college like only reluctantly you know yeah um and i just you know i don't ever think about anything that way i, I never think about anything that way cool so i don't have uh <laughs> i'm like i'm not so yeah i don't ha i don't have any uh sense of wonder about it i i i i know how you feel i i figure if you just keep walking down that really long hallway one of the doors one of the mm -hmm. door knobs you jiggle is going to be unlocked yeah and quite often yeah and, and quite often um you'd find you know you find one that's that's unlocked and you're just entering it you enter the room based on just like a superficial understanding of the exterior of the door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, that's when the adventure starts, right? <laughs> oh my. Oh. How about, um, uh, light bulb moments when, when you've been doing any of this and I don't care if it's a fishing or a hunting or a foraging or a conservation or a media moment, has anything ever just popped into your head and you've thought, Oh, wow. That's revelatory. Mm. Narrow it down for me a little bit. Like what? Oh, uh, well, here's an easy one. And, and being a business writer from way back, my first thought is, okay, at one point in time, you were in a meeting or you're on a phone call with Churnin Group, and they said, let's do it or something. That's oh. The first one that came to mind, I'm thinking, okay, oh, oh, geez, now it's becoming very real. So, you know, did you have any feelings like that? It, maybe it was the first bear you shot, or maybe it was um, your first TV episode, which I can barely remember in my world, but uh, and probably should forget it permanently. But, you know. Yeah, it, uh, I would say one is the totally impulsive idea we had to buy a shack yeah in southeast alaska sight unseen <laughs> which i just wouldn't there'd be so many reasons that that wouldn't happen now um 
And it's funny because I, I bought it with three other people. Mm-hmm. All of us were like just starting to have careers. None of us, you know, three, one was married, three weren't, um, had money, like the money had to scramble to come up with 20,000 bucks a piece to buy a shack. Uh, then had to go look at it after we bought it. <laughs> and I mean, that changed my life, right? That's been, been proven to be like a constant in my life and just how much I've learned and thought about. I mean, it just, I mean, from everything about how I, it, it changed every part of my life, like exposure to that environment, right? Which is a very inspiring, very challenging environment. Weirdly, uh, if I was going to pick another thing, like from way ago, mm-hmm. uh, when I was in, I think maybe like 10th grade, my teacher, Robert Heaton, I had written this like comparison contrast paper. And he said, he's going to submit it to a writing contest. And I, for some reason that I don't understand, told him not, asked him not to. He did it anyway. Mm-hmm. And I got, I didn't even know what it meant at the time. I thought I, I thought I had won, but I was first runner up, which I didn't know meant second place. <laughs> <laughs> My initial thing was that like what, what, like the Westminster dog show. <laughs> I won first runner up and listen, what's so funny is, so I win this thing. And then there's like a, like this ceremony at this place called um, the Froenthal theater. Okay. In my, the, the town near where I grew up. Yeah. And we go down there and the girl that won first place got a cash prize. And as first runner up or second place, they gave me a, they gave me a, an insight or a, a thesaurus. Oh. So, um, I can't remember what the first runner up got 500 bucks or something like that. Okay. And I was disappointed in my thesaurus. And I remember Mr. Heaton took me to the ceremony. And I remember Mr. Heaton said, there's a thousand dollars worth of words in that book. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Did you ever like, get that much value out of it? <laughs> how, how right, right, how right he was, but his dollar figure amount was off a bit. <laughs> uh, too, too high or too low. <laughs> I would say it was grossly too low in the end, but yeah. uh, the sentiment the sentiment was correct. You yeah, know? yeah, you know, yeah. And, and I think it was probably like he had like he had a really him doing that, just him, you know. Yeah, yeah. Had a huge impact on how I thought about things. If uh, I was telling someone not long ago, if you imagine a like a Terminator type scenario where someone's going to go back in time and make it that I didn't become a writer. Yeah. What they would need to do is just kill Mr. Heaton and <laughs> kill my 10th grade teacher. And it would have never have ever happened. <laughs> oh, that is so funny. My, my, mine was a long time after that grade, but uh, I have one of those guys. Absolutely. That's spectacular. Uh, if he's still che- if he's still teaching, he's he's getting free beer on everybody. Just telling your story. No, he's uh he's still alive, man. We still share emails. Oh, he's I love retired. It. He's been retired for. I, I you know I, I would never off the record. I cannot believe this guy is still alive. Wow. He's in his in his nineties. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he's there's always something going on, but he just he can't. I don't know, man. He still reads and corresponds, and he's amazing. Too tough to die. Yeah, no, he's dedicated. You know what's funny too about him was like, I remember there was some millage issue, you know? Uh huh, uh huh. And the teachers are all worked up about it. And I remember Mr. Heaton being like, I'll teach in a pole barn. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I mean, I hang out with a lot of buckaroos. I mean, professional cowboys, and, and nothing phases them. No, they're, they're used to sleeping in the dirt and eating beans. You know? Yeah, this dude was there to teach, man. He didn't care about anything else. You know, yeah. he was great. He well, was great. My mother was a teacher for 32 years. I, she's one of the few teachers I know who 
probably would have done it for free if she could figure out how to heat heat the house and keep us clothed and fed. Yeah, no, he was he was dedicated, man. Love it. You know, somewhere in my notes, I have Aldo Leopold, and um, uh, we might have talked around it a little bit the last time you and I. No, talked. that was like, yeah, we well, we, I yeah, well, I mean, that's like a when you're talking about revelatory moments, man. Yeah, um, yeah. Getting turned on to getting turned on to Sand County Almanac. It's a big thing for me. Well, you know, interestingly, uh, uh, the shack analogy goes both ways on that story. I mean, you got mm-hmm. one, he got one. You ever been to that one? Uh, no, I've been, no, I haven't. I've been invited there and had a chance to go there and like stay there through something, but no, I haven't been, yeah. I haven't been to it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what was it about that? Like- what was it about that book that, that kind of opened your eyes? It was the first conservation book I ever read. Yeah. And it just felt like it was, it just felt very much written for me or, you know, written for, written for the people I knew. Yeah. You can't believe that he was writing that stuff in the twenties, man. Yeah. He was, he was of a different age. Well, you know, we talked the other day about how, uh, I don't know if you remember us talking about this. I was saying, imagine if you came up with, uh, Imagine if you came up with the Pittman Robertson fund idea today, how well yeah. it'd go over. Yeah. So I just got a I just got a press release where a US representative and he's got fifteen co signers to remove Pittman Robertson. Yeah. So there you go. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> It's an interesting argument. He's making an interesting argument. Why would you have a constitutional freedom tax, right? Yeah, so. yeah. Scary. Uh, I'll, I'll have to watch that one with interest. Be, you know, it's been tried. I, I, I think it's say. a. I, it's it's like a. You know, it's 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 doomed, but it's like yeah. a. You know, there's a, it's theatrical, right? You no, know, I wrote some of those back in California in the day. You know, they were all about getting attention and uh, and making a point. And mm-hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, I get it. And, and it makes, the, yeah, it makes discussion. Yeah. The whole PR part of that, um, P dash R Pittman Robertson part of that is, you know, they've tried to take the money before and use it for other things and, uh, and got shut down in, in, in any number of ways. So mm-hmm. ho- hopefully mm-hmm. people re- will remember the past is prologue. We'll see. Sure. Um, are you still on, uh, I think you were, we talked about the TRCP, it, but I didn't, I don't recall if, if you told me or not, are you still sitting on the board of that group? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. I got, I, I don't know how many years I got yeah. left in my board. Appointment, but yeah, I'm on the board there. <laughs> Unless they impeach you, I guess. <laughs> no, we have yeah. a good, we have a good relationship. Well, it's a great group. And like I said, I was, I was there at the very beginning. Oh yeah. Yeah. We talked about, yeah. You knew yeah. back from the gym range. Dave. Yeah. You, you knew, who was the yeah. other guy? Ollie something. I forgot his name. He was big in the nope. sheep world, but anyway, you don't know that name. They cornered me one day at the shot show and said, Hey, you're doing all- interviews for field and stream. Yeah. Well, let's sit down. Boom. They were like the first interview I did that day, that week, for that matter. Uh, um, put yourself on television. Um, what What is something you try to do every time you're in front of a camera, at least every episode? What What is the most important message that you want to convey? Um. I guess I'm trying to con- I'm just trying hard to art- to articulate or convey the predominant um, thoughts I have because which is harder than you know is difficult because so much being outside is just it, 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 it's quiet a lot of people like it for the quiet right sure and, um, yeah and you experience things that are impactful to you, but part of the luxury is you don't need to articulate them. It could just be wholly lived internally. Right. Yeah. And so it's, it's struggling to, you know, as a host, you have an obligation to, um, translate your Mm -hmm. experience for Mm -hmm. people. And so the struggle is just to, to stay talkative, right. To, To like stay communicative with the camera. Yeah. 
And, and what I usually do is I'm usually imagining. One of the reasons I like to work with camera guys I like a lot is, is you know, it's, it's all, it's delivered, most of it's delivered to camera. Much of it's delivered to camera. Yeah, yeah. So it's like I'm telling the person I'm with mm-hmm. more, much more than I would tell them if they weren't holding it. You know, it's interesting. I know exactly how you feel because I do the same thing. It's a lot easier for a bird hunter to do that than a big game hunter who, you know, has to sh- talk like this all the time. Mm-hmm. But but I know exactly what you mean. And my A camera guy, the guy who follows me and not, not the dogs, I got another guy who does that. Oh, okay. He and I get along like brothers. I mean, like good brothers. <laughs> I need to qualify that one when I'm talking about me and my brother or maybe you and your brother for that matter. But, uh. Yeah, it it is tough. Um, For sure. What about the opposite? What, yeah, my my hard and fast rule on TV is I never show a body pile. Uh, but we're talking about you know nine pheasants on a tailgate or something. It's kind of hard to ignore you know a moose when he's down. Oh yeah, I don't have. You know what? That was the thing that one thing I was surprised about when I got started in outdoor TV. I was surprised the degree to which. Uh, um, outdoor networks had really tried to hide all you know yeah. blood and things. I remember a rule. I never had to deal with this, but there was a rule like no raw meat, no exposed yeah. bone. I, I think yeah. it's just ridiculous. I, I don't have any. Um, we show everything. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I mean, we show everything, everything, everything. And no, I wouldn't. I think even in that way, I wouldn't have a problem showing. Yeah. A, a couple bag limits of legally harvested squirrels, right? Yeah. That doesn't bother me. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's funny. Uh, I remembered. Yeah, the, the 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 one that always got me was the excessive flopping cause. Mm, you know, like with turkey. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, exactly. sure, and and you know, I don't. I, I try to. I used to think that we would push it, and people would push back. Yeah. Right. Like now and then, you know, you'll write something and you're like, somehow this is going to wind up not being in there. Like someone's going to, as an editor, yeah, I, I'm going to wind up needing to argue about whether this belongs there. Yep. And we would get, we would put really, we would use what some might regard as very graphic footage. Yeah. And I was just always, um, and I, early on, I was like, you know, when will the, blowback come you know when will the pushback come yeah and it doesn't and then in a lot of ways it was like we're the show became really celebrated for that right yeah it became celebrated for people like seeing these things and learning about these things and and and, uh i've never thought i've never thought of it as as like, like I don't think of like gutting a deer as like ugly, right? I don't I don't think of it as somehow wrong or ugly or should be hidden. If it's offensive to someone, um, you know, I would just suggest that they that they don't watch. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Um, oh, I just had a thought on that. Anyway, you, you know, I I wonder if that is just a just a thought because everybody kind of understands. Well, we're making food here. Um, a lot of that stuff within that context becomes completely and totally okay. Yeah, that's probably true. I think that that, that changes it because you're watching the transformation of food. And then, and then conversely, look at, uh, I remember I was working on a story one time in Argentina about Argentinian steak, right? Uh-huh. And I remember basically just meeting a guy and getting an invite walking into a slaughter plant oh yeah yeah as casual as going into a shoe store yeah you know with a journalist right and like that just isn't going to happen in this country anymore yeah (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) but it's like just like there's like what's to hide you know the attitude like sure have a look yeah it is Um, funny absolutely the whole the whole go ahead well i think that it does i think that it does change people's minds i mean you know people in, 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 in many ways are, are pretty pragmatic. And I think that your general, like, like a general, your general non hunting public, if they're watching, um, an animal die or they're watching it get cut up or butchered, um, some 
in their mind, if they understand like what is happening practically, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. they experience it differently than if they don't understand what they're seeing or what the outcome of what they're seeing is. Right. Yeah. But it just doesn't, I, I don't, um, I don't care to just hide certain realities like that, you know, because there are also things that I think are instructive. Um, I'm I'm not made, I don't make products for in order that they're palatable to people who would, who might otherwise not like them. Right. I I make things for people who want to see what they're seeing. Yeah, I get it. And, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm with you 110% on that. And I think again, part of it is the context. Part of it is how you actually do it. And you know what I mean, whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, the guy who rides his uh, bull elk, like a motorcycle or whatever the, you know, however you can disrespect versus respect the quarry. Mm-hmm. Even when you're parting it out, yeah, cool. And, and yeah, and I guess people can see that. But I, like, I, I view it as being that it's um, instructional. I think mm-hmm. it's visually arresting. Um, I have a lot of admiration for the skill set and process that goes into butchering. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, I don't. If I get a deer, I don't feel sad about it. I'm glad that I got the deer. And if I, if I didn't want to get it, I wouldn't have gotten it. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And I, and I'm proud of the item and uh, I haven't really in that I've considered some sort of censorship around sensitive material. I've only considered it in what's as much as I can do without getting it to be where I can't show my material anymore. Yeah. But thankfully I can't think of any, it shocks me. Like one of the most shocking things is I can't, I, I've never had any like legitimate censorship. There's never been something that, that I have wanted to show, but then the man, the powers that be mm-hmm. have said, no, it just doesn't happen. Yeah. I can't believe it doesn't happen. I, I would have thought when I started doing television, especially, I would have thought that's the only fight I was going to have for the rest of my life. I know it just never happened. Yeah. And, and I tell you, it's rare. You know, uh, you've been on some of those. I was on Discovery Channel, um, and I thought nothing would pass muster with them. Mm-hmm. But it's sure. a, it's poultry and it's dogs, and who who doesn't love both of those things? But yep, yep. you guys, you got a different road to hoe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, surpr- I'm always surprised by how little... And I don't even mean I don't even want to call it censorship because yeah. I think that would be something different. But I'm surprised yeah. by how unobstructed we've been in being able to show visceral graphic yeah. images. Pardon the pun. Let's have some fun here. If you had to take if if there's one thing you take on most of your trips, hunting trips that we don't think of, what would it be? Hmm. Hopefully nothing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'd hate to think that I, I would hate to think that I have some like, like super impractical thing that I need as like an emotional support system. No, I mean something like, do you like a leather man or do you like a Swiss Army knife? Oh, <laughs> I forgot my no. headlamp on this float. So last night I I'm had a, to look at the dang stars the whole time. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. I'll tell you a couple of things. So I have a lot of, I'm, I've used a Surefire Optimus headlamp. Yeah. Which I love. And my buddies cannot believe that that's my headlamp of choice and it's become something of a joke. Uh, I, even when I have, even with ultralight folks, like I carry a, a multi-tool. Yeah. Yeah. And you always get people who are like, oh, it's unnecessary and all the extra ounces, but I always <laughs> seem to be one the one that winds up fixing their shit. Is, isn't that the truth? <laughs> so I do that. Um. Yeah, I carry those. I'm big. I'm a big believer in carrying those. Yeah. 
I switched to scary pens a long time ago for water purification. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, switched. I, I used those and just gave up on pump filters. You know, funny. We we had my pump as a backup on this trip. Uh, I really liked the the hanging bag style of Katadin. Sure. That yeah. one. Man, when when you're in a river camp, you can do that. If you're just walking around in the woods, yeah, I think a steri pen makes sense. Yeah. All right, you're a guy who travels the world, um, and you're a hunter and an angler and a forager and all of that. Uh, same thing. If, if if you wanted to help us on our next trip to Chile for Big Brown, Sea, sea Run Browns, or Perdiz in Uruguay, what, what what is your most important travel tip? Let me think about that one. My most important travel tip. It would probably be about choosing your companions. Uh-huh. Let me tell you a, a thing. I'm, I'm going to tell you a quote that I wish was mine, but it was a friend of mine named Jim was once talking about the fishing camp. Him and his buddies would fish in Alaska every year. Okay. And they would, they would rent a house and fish in Alaska. Yeah. And in describing his crew of friends, he said, you need to wait in line if you want to wash a dish. And uh, that was one of the best summations of good people to travel with. It's like people who just do stuff, right? They take yeah. action yeah. and they do stuff and they're prepared and they're ready to jump in. The no weak links. Yeah. Yeah. I also like people who are, I also like to travel with people who are very, very reluctant to pull the cord. Okay. Very reluctant or pull the plug, whatever you want to call it, whatever metaphor. Yeah. 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 Who are very reluctant to say die. Yeah. But they do know that that, is a reasonable option should it get to that they're not foolhardy they're not dumb but they're very reluctant yeah and therein is the art Mm -hmm. i was watching people who just don't know when right yeah they're the ones who fall off mount everest you know yeah and and like i shouldn't say we all know them most of us don't know them most of us don't know the ones who just don't know when it's time, <laughs> but we all, we all know a lot of people who think it's time to quit way before it's actually time to quit. Yeah. You know, uh, funny, don't we just gravitate away from those kind of people? Just I gave, naturally. I gave my, yeah. Well, I, I do. Yeah. I gave my kid a piece of advice not long ago. Well, no, it was cause it was last summer we were fishing and some of the people we were with wanted to go in. Some people didn't. And he was very annoyed. And I said to him, you're going to spend your whole life around people who don't like to fish as much as you do. Um, and I think that there's like a piece of life advice. <laughs> there's it, like there some life advice. In within that. It, it's absolutely true. Especially if you generalize beyond fishing. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna spend your whole life around like avoiding people who yeah. aren't gonna be as diehard as you are. Yeah, you know, it's it's my wife is a uh world class custom jewelry designer. Okay. And so I only bring that up not to brag, but she is brag worthy. But um so she gets people who walk into her studio and and, and they want a diamond ring for hundred and ninety nine dollars. And she only finds that out after an hour of working with them on mm. design. Yeah. When they ought it, just like the people who don't like to fish as much as we do, it ought to be tattooed on their forehead. So we don't have to go through that. Yeah. You know. Carry a card. We'd want to almost, you'd <laughs> want to almost be rude and yeah. say, you yeah. know, before we get started here, let me tell you something. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, the first tv meeting this kind of gets into like a little bit of that the first tv meeting i ever went to a 
the woman who was running the meeting. I mean, it's the first time I ever went into a room with the intention of sort of like creating something for television. Yeah. And the woman said, I want to start off by saying this is impossible. <laughs> Not, nothing ever gets done. With that, let's get started. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. You know what she just did? <laughs> she just separated the men from the boys. Oh, it was amazing, man. Yeah, I, I knew I, was, I knew I heard something great at the time, and only oh, I have quoted that probably more than any other quote it's, that I've heard in my life. Oh, that is hilarious. You know, that's the kind of stuff that happens at uh, Rockefeller Center, you know, in the top floors. Those are the, those, oh, those yeah. are like major network kinds of discussions at, that probably often start with that kind of a lead. Yeah. You know? This is impossible. Yeah. Nothing ever gets done. With that, let's get started. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> that was great, dude. And you know what? And for several years, she was correct. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, been there and done that. My first meeting was just the opposite. They said, when can you start? <laughs> oh, there you go. But that, they were that, desperate. That's... They were trying to upgrade their programming, and they they could only settle for me. So. That's a good. That's a good thing to hear in a meeting. It was nice to be. And that makes you feel like. That makes you like you feel like you're being productive. I I know. I I, I still regret walking away from those guys, but uh, that's life, I guess. Um, let's let's end on this one because uh, the, the, I think to a great degree the overarching uh, message from my the story I'm going to write is about your passion for conservation and and you're slightly different than most people's take on it and how you create a way bigger tent than everybody else how it'll go from there i'll let you know but in all of that what is critical 10 years from now that we need to start working on now in that whole the the, the, the biggest broadest version of the term conservation oh man I know. I should have sent these along to you a week ago. <laughs> no, it's a great question. Uh, my brother Danny is an ecologist in Alaska. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to him one day about conservation efforts in the lower 48 and similar conservation efforts Oh, one sec, sorry, my boys. What's up, buddy? Two things. One, I lost my dive knife. Ooh, I'm on a phone call, though, so I'll catch you. How'd you lose your dive knife? It fell out of the bottom hole. Oh, it cut through the sheath. Let me come talk to you in a minute, Kai. Bummer. Oh, man. What did he lose? Oh. He, well, my, my, we discovered one day that um that uh in the central district of montana you're allowed to spear fish for any non-game fish okay yeah okay and what no one realizes is the state regards bluegills as non-game oh really <laughs> they're introduced yeah well so are walleye which are game okay. so are yeah. yellow perch which are game right so yeah. are rainbow trout which are a game yep, fish. Yep. So our brown trout, which are a game fish. Well, the bluegills, non-game. All right. So he's the he's the only person I know that is an avid bluegill spearfish. <laughs> oh my god. He's got a big giant cooler full of him right now. Oh yeah. And, but he lost his dive knife. Um, oh, the poor guy. It, it cut through the it cut through the sheath. So well, that's <laughs> what does that say about the sheath? <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, it's well, it's a very low. It's like a knot. It's yeah, really not not designed for youngsters. Um, so <laughs> so we were talking one day, and we we're talking about like conservation, what conservation efforts look like in the lower forty eight versus yeah. in Alaska, yeah. and he observed to me that in the lower 48 we're generally in a recovery phase right yeah and he said in alaska we're still in a discovery phase in many ways they're still trying to get their arms around what's there uh 
he's worked on describing salmon or he works on describing salmon runs that have never been scientifically described. Uh, yeah. Okay. People know they're, people know they're there, right? They've known they're there for hundreds of years, but no one's ever put numbers to it. How many? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, um, and that kind of struck me, right. That, that uh, to think of us as being like a continent that's, that's in recovery phase. Uh huh. I think that if I was going to focus on like a conservation challenge in a very general way, I would say that uh, stopping the bleeding on habitat loss. The the the, the animals, it's man like what it's recovering animals is manageable as we've seen again and again and again. Yeah. If you have if you have the space for them. Right. Yeah. I'd hate to see us need to do it, but if the habitat there, I mean, like I hesitate to even say this because this is going to be upsetting to a lot of dear friends of mine. You can, you can theoretically picture that if you had the right number of decades, you could re recover the wild Turkey. Mm -hmm. Right. It'd be painful. Yeah. It'd be expensive, but you could re recover the wild Turkey organically if, you're saying if you if you had if there's a place that can support them yeah right so i worry about you know it concerns me like disease issues concern me i think cwd isn't yet and i'm I like i i'm very afraid of cwd i'm afraid of cwd in that it would turn out that it posed a human risk right i like yeah I, i'm fearful that will that that at some point down the road CWD will emerge as like an immediate human risk. Right now it's a risk. What do you call the difference between, I don't know, like it's a risk, like there's a risk there, but what do you call it when the risk becomes actual? Yeah, somebody um, has, uh, science has determined the tipping point. Yeah, I, I fret about CWD yeah. in that I fret about the idea that somehow hunters would wind up contracting a disease, a uh, a uh, 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 degenerative brain disease from venison that to me is a devastating thought right mm -hmm. um i think that we should be very aggressively continue to research cwd and continue trying to control and fight cwd because of the potential for human risk but chief among my conservation concerns is is just the slow steady loss of habitat because habitat is a lot harder to get back than animals are. Yeah. Animals reproduce, you know, like they reproduce. If they're properly managed, you can grow a wildlife population. It's hard to grow habitat. We do it in certain cases. It's hard to grow habitat. It's hard to recover habitat. I just worry about loss of habitat. Good. Good. On that note, you've done because well. Because I think that's the hardest. <laughs> yeah, that is the hardest thing to remedy. Like that would, that's the, that's tough, you know. And I don't mean to like, I'm not meaning to simplify or like underappreciate work that people who restore wildlife populations, like I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to like put shade on the efforts of people who restore wildlife populations. But what makes that possible is habitat. Yeah, it's a tangled web. Yeah, uh, there's a place. There's a place to do it, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I floated past an old gypsum mine yesterday, and uh, was reminded of something much like that. Hey, man, uh, it's not impossible. I killed a bull elk in Kentucky on top of an old coal mine. Right? Yeah, it's not yeah. impossible. We've done some phenomenal. We as Americans have done some amazing work in that area, but habitat loss scares me more than any other thing when i think of the future of hunting in america you're listening to the upland nation podcast i'm scott linden your host thanks for listening to this incredible and exclusive interview with steve ranella just a reminder that we uh we put this all together as i was writing a cover story for hook and barrel magazine you can find them online or at newsstands or at cabela's and bass pro shop stores so 
learn more there. You're getting all the details here. In fact, we've gone down a few rabbit holes already, and uh, many of those never made it to the magazine story, but uh, you're getting them here and nowhere else. First, a word from our sponsor, sageandbreaker.com. Most of their gear has a lifetime warranty. It is heirloom quality gear that um, you'll pass down and they'll pass down. And then, of course, there are all the other things that we call in the trade consumables from their CLP, which will clean, lube, and protect your firearms, to their tools and their brushes and everything else you need to care for your shotgun. It's all right there at sageandbreaker.com. Sign up for the mailing list. You'll get advance notice of any upcoming sales at sageandbreaker.com. Now let's get back to the talk I had recently with meat eater Steve Ranella. So let's start with the let's start with a good one. You describe yourself as an environmentalist with a gun. Tell me more. The in my community, well, let me really quick first off say that when I was growing up, through the word conservation, yeah, through the lens of the United Conservation Club, and I knew that because when I joined Michigan Trap, I had to, in order to sell fur, oh, yeah, ban a fur auction, you had to join the Michigan Trappers Association. Once you joined the Michigan Trappers Association, you became a de facto member of the Michigan United Conservation Clubs. That was about the extent of my knowledge of conservation as a kid. Um, we had the attitude that natural resources, the lands we had around us kind of fell from the sky. And it was, you know, get years while the getting's good. Um, was was yeah. the 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 mentality I had as you know well into being a teenager. Um, I I mentioned had sort of a you know a conservation awakening in my early twenties, mid twenties, and became a conservationist. And and over time, it occurred to me that. The conservation is from an environmentalist in many respects is just semantics. Um, you know, a lot of our end goals are the same. We like to see clean air and clean water. We like to see healthy wildlife habitat, the abundant wildlife resources. Right? If there's a difference, and it is, it's just, you know, it's like it's like kind of like arguing about how many angels fit on the head of a pin. If there is a difference, it would be that conservation ha ha is kind of loaded to the idea of one being comfortable with exploitation of renewable resources, right? And one has more of a preservationist, um, one has more of a preservationist connotation. But I, yeah, I, I am comfortable, however you want to describe it as a conservationist or you know, an environmentalist with a gun, I'm, I'm comfortable with either. Would you, you know, just, just for my own edification. So let's call it, let's call one side of it, uh, consumptive outdoor recreation. Is that, is that where you think you, you're, you're okay? Is that where you fall out? Yeah. Yeah. I like to call it, uh, you know, bloody and bloody hands-on relationship to nature. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's what I, you know, that's what I've tried so hard to encourage my kids to, young you know but I've, I've been doing it for a long time now because my oldest is 12 i've tried very hard and articulate that to them a certain relationship to nature where it's honorific right but they're not apart from it they're one with it which means they're a player in it they have they have power yeah yeah it's not it, it, it's not meant to, like it's not there just to be observed out the window it's there to be experienced and like it or not in this day and age we have humans have by necessity a very 
very heavy handed role in preserving nature. It's not there by accident anymore. Yeah. You know, I remember years ago when I did have the paper, I, I wrote an op-ed piece. Well, I guess it was an editorial. It was my paper. Um, somebody was complaining about uh, sh- shooting coyotes on a, on, on the heart mountain antelope refuge to try mm-hmm. and try and create a better balance there. They were eat, literally eating, eating the lambs as they were coming out of the mothers. And uh, she argued that that was terrible and bad and we shouldn't be, you know, we should let nature take its course. I said, well then knock your house down and create some more coyote habitat. Mm-hmm. And she didn't know yeah, what to say. It, it, not going back in the bottle. I yeah. mean, you know, and like I said, the resources we have are because people fought for them. For a long time, look at American history, which I like to do. For a long time, we had wilderness in spite of our best efforts to conquer it all. <laughs> Today, we have wilderness decided that we want it. Got it. And that was a... You're breaking up, Steve. Are you are you oh, are you leaning to the left or something? I don't know. I got my earplugs in. Oh, um, you know, let me try something different. All right. Well, I bet I know what it is. Are you good now? So far, yeah. That I mean, yeah, I was you... using my buds, but who knows? Um, so that was a like fundamental shift in the American mindset, right? And yeah. everybody hasn't made that shift. But I mean, you know, the, 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 the one person that most American hunters can name who is in large part, you know, hugely influential, if not larger responsible for that mind shift would have been Roosevelt. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, during that transition of having wilderness, despite our best efforts to kill it and then having wilderness because we're willing to suffer for it, suffer for it economically you know, yeah. um, suffer yeah. for it in various ways. We have it because we decided that we wanted it. Hey, by the way, did you see that? Um, uh, what, what was it on history channel? Doris Kearns Goodwin's bio biography on TR just about a week or two ago. No, I did oh, not go on Netflix. You know, you've heard of Netflix, right? Yep. <laughs> it's on there. It probably is. I mean, it's, it, I think it was a history channel special. I'm not sure, but I'm sure it'll be there. It was good. Yeah, a lot of, a lot, I think a lot of channel stuff winds yeah. up there. She did a good job. Um, so, okay. So while we're on that JAG, um, I know one of the things that that's important to you, and we're going to probably develop a little sidebar out of it, is your whole you want to make you you want to make a conservation message of some sort to uh, hook and barrel readers. Uh, you you want to just riff on that a bit? Yeah. Go. So, I grew up very, very deeply involved with nature, though I wouldn't have described it that way at the time. I mean, the way I would have described it at the time is that we hunted and fished and trapped, and we hunted and fished and trapped a lot. Yeah. My dad's friends, he was friends with because he hunted and fished with them. Yeah. I have no recollection of beginning starting fishing. I was very young. I started trapping muskrats and selling the furs when I was 10. Um, you weren't allowed to hunt deer and small game to your 12, but I was doing it before that. Right. Like, and, and I loved that stuff deeply. It was how it, we, that was just the, how I defined myself. Sure. I was into other things that kids are into. I had friends, we had BMX bikes, we had girlfriends, you know, whatever, music, everything. That was how I defined myself. Um, it was only so much later that I came to realize that to, to apply a certain terminology to it, right, that, 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 that there would be that I held that without knowing it, without having articulated it this way, I came to realize that I held nature, I held nature as being sacred. 
right? Yeah. I, I realized that I had, um, to use the same word again, like I had a, like, uh, I, I had an honorific view of it. I honored it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just didn't know that. I loved it. Mm -hmm. I loved, I loved nature. I was a tree hugger without recognizing it. Mo many, not all, but many hunters and anglers have those deep feelings for the natural world, have those deep feelings for nature, but they don't, are, are, they don't articulate in that way. And I think that learning to articulate how you really feel about it will help you, is helpful to define what exactly you owe to it. Yeah. I love my family very much, right? I would do anything for my family, right? I would be inconvenienced by them. Kids are, for a large measure, for much of their life, kids are a financial inconvenience. They cost you money. <laughs> they cost you time. They cost you opportunity. Yet, we all will acknowledge that it's all worth it. Why? Because you love them, right? Yeah. So learning, recognizing that I loved nature and wildlife habitat, right? I, I loved the outdoors. Helps you down the path of realizing that maybe it's okay to be inconvenienced by it. That every, um, that everything that could be exploited for monetary gain maybe there's some things we don't do maybe there's some sacrifices that we make to return to roosevelt for a moment people now act like people lose sight of how controversial what he was doing was it was enormously controversial yeah a bunch of legislators came together and tried to make a plan on how they were going to stop him from creating national forests or forest reserves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, the story of the midnight forest. Yeah. <laughs> he knew he wasn't, he knew he wasn't going to be able to beat a veto. So he's, you know, stayed up till whatever him and Gifford Pinchot and others like crash coursed it signed a 20 some more national forest in the law and woke up and signed the bill preventing him from doing it. Hugely controversial. Imagine this too. This is an interesting thing to think about. Hunters like to almost to the point of over observing our contributions through the Pittman Robertson fund. It's become a thing that you hear more and more. And, I, and I'm delighted. I'm glad that hunters know that history that they know the history of how much wildlife conservation and, and, and uh, recovery they have funded, right? I think there's a couple of important things to note, though. The vast majority of that money is not coming from hunters. It's coming from recreational shooters. Yeah, yeah. Two, picture that you went to SHOT Show today and stood in front of the, uh, an audience, and you announced legislation that would add a 13% federal excise tax on all guns and ammunition sold, and that that money was going to go to help wildlife. Oh, never, How do you feel that that would be received? Never fly today. They'd shoot you. Yeah. Yeah. But why are we so proud of it? Is that a rhetorical question? Or yeah. Rhetorical, <laughs> rhetorical question. Um. Because to answer it, isn't it, to, trying to be polite here, but isn't it because back when it was envisioned, it was actually the vision of the hunting community, the Ikes yeah. and a whole bunch of those kind of guys. And they were coming out of nothing. It was they the had 30s, nothing. yeah. They were coming out of nothing. And here we are in a position of plenty, right? And it's just inspiring that they were coming out of nothing. Yeah. I think now in the, in the time of plenty, I always point out to people relative to my dad's grow relative to my dad's experiences as an outdoorsman in the post, when he got home from world war two, 
I live very much in the good old days. Right? Yeah. But I really respect some of those major moves that were done then in the 30s. In the 60s, we had the Wilderness Act, which in the House had one dissenting vote to create wilderness areas. Probably Strom You'd, Thurmond. <laughs> you would know. They thought it didn't go far enough. Yeah. They thought the protections, they thought the protections didn't go far enough. 17 dissenting votes in the Senate. You would never get it done today. I just have begun to ask myself a lot, why is that? Is it because we're coming from a position of strength? And we don't, there's no call for desperation? Or is it because something has like changed in what we're willing to sacrifice? I don't know. I hope it's that, I hope it's that we're just in a position of strength and that if times were to get bad, we would be, we would be re-engaged to get that radical again. Good question and interesting, hopefully, theor theory and only a theory for a while. At least. <laughs> I hope so, man. Yeah. I love it how good it is. I mean, we have it great. People, people, you're absolutely right, though. And, and I talk about, uh, you know, a lot of my speeches, uh, I talk about um, the Pittman-Robertson uh, bill and, and when it came into law. And, and these are dog club members for the most part, largely mm -hmm. dog, uh, bird hunting, bird dog guys. And half of them don't even know what it is. They they mm -hmm. think they think their license dollars or tax income tax dollars fund wildlife management. It's, yeah, it's always mind boggling to me. So I'll keep beating the drum too. You know, that's what it's for. Yeah, okay. I love people to know it, and I like people to ask. I want them to know the history, and then I want them to ask themselves, "Would I support that today?" Yeah. Or would I, right, label it something and move on? It's interesting. It's it's really interesting to think about. Yeah, you're you're exactly right. You just wonder, don't you? Luckily, we don't have to worry about it. In fact, probably not at all. Now they think. No. About. You know, uh, as a side note, man, I'll tell you. This is the. I, I was telling my friends this the other day. We we're hanging out. You know, I've, I've been lucky to go all over the country, right? Mm -hmm. And everywhere you go, there's two, you'll, you'll meet two people, and they're often next door neighbors, okay? <laughs> there's the guy that can't do it all. He's frustrated that he just, there's too much to do. You can't scratch the surface, right? Yeah. And then the guy next door is everything went to shit. Everything sucks. Fish and game ruined it. The wolves ate it. The you whatever. <laughs> right? Yep. Yeah. I, I meet I meet a lot of those. <laughs> right next to the dude that's like, dude, you can't I can't get to everything. I wish I had more hours in the day. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's it's so true. I, I guess we should be knock wood. Let's uh, let's uh, let's cap this part of it with with uh, a thank you to Jim Range and everybody who founded what at the time was the TRCA, the Conservation Alliance. Oh, well, uh, yep, that's, I, that's yep. deep yeah, I have a good buddy who was there on on the ground floor back in the day. And then I had Jim range on my radio show way back too. So oh, yeah, I wish I would have met him. They did a, yeah. um, at the TRCP event this year in DC, they did a, you know, they all always mentioned Jim range. Yeah. Yeah. They did a little, you know, they had a guy get up and say some words about him and yeah, he'd been an interesting guy to me. Oh, he was fascinating. He, like, for sure seems like the kind of guy that couldn't get to it all, man. There's too much to do. <laughs> yeah, but you know, he had the right attitude. He was the first guy you cited. I mean, he was the he was the poster boy for those people who just uh, there were not enough hours in the day to to, to do enough good. But he mm -hmm. he kept doing it. So anyway, um, switch gears. Let's talk business for a little bit. Um, what's what's your vision of 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 uh, the meat eater incorporated business these days. What is it right now? Yeah. Or well, we'll talk about down the road as well. We have, um, 
we have a ton of overlap across our businesses, but we have a media entity, right? We, we, we produce a lot of outdoor media. Yeah. And then we make through various, through three brands that we own, we produce consumer goods, right. so apparel, game calls, accessories, Urban. Um, we'll continue. <laughs> we'll continue doing acquisitions in the in the in the gear world and we'll continue making media um i think that today well let me go back media Eater started out just simply as a tv show yeah okay yeah. it was a tv and the way that we were attempting to finance our tv show would be that you would get sponsorship dollars. Um, one of our very first sponsors right out of the gate was a company called First Light. Yeah, yeah. And over the years, I became friends with the founders. They were in Ketchum. And we very much grew up together. Uh, they were just making base layer. They were making merino base layers, and we started to work together. Mm-hmm. And we came up together and we influenced, you know, they influenced through people they work with and, and our friendship, like they had an influence on our media and we had an influence on their product development and we came to understand their clientele and they, mm-hmm. understood, our, they understood our audience. And in time, um, it just became clear that we just would deepen that relationship and and create and and there were so many synergies at play between the two businesses that why not just make it you know a very formal synergy um and so instead of this situation where there's a there's a schedule of deliverables that we provide to first light right yeah and that is that it's we're in you know have a lot of exposure to their product development. We know what's coming up. It's seamless integration into the, into the products we make. Um, our experiences outside doing, doing the things we do can influence the lineup there. It just works very well. Yeah. Yeah. And so as much as, you know, as much as we can do that, where we identify um, like our team, our team at large, wherever they are around the country, we have people all over the place. Mm-hmm. Our team at large, like we identify products and things that we're really excited about. And then we oftentimes um, know, you know, founders of business or we have exposure to people over the course of many years who have built companies up. And it gets to a point where um, we're able to collaborate and combine you know, combine our forces together. And I feel that that, that that strategy is in in my view, that's the best way to prolong um, and increase and enhance our ability to, to, to produce the entertainment that I want to produce. Um, yeah, yeah. And to make, to, to, to make, the best products that are most that are going to be most impactful in the lives of our audience members. Got it. Um, it, it, it's very like, it, it's very seamless. I never, th- there was no point in when, when we started out, when I started out, I started out media as a joint venture. Mm-hmm. Uh, I started out media as a joint venture with a production company in New York. Yeah. And yeah. They, they like most famously made the Bourdain properties. Right. Yep, so yep. zero, zero production. We started out like, I owned half, they owned half. And we ran that for, you know, we ran that for as long as we could without having um, like a, a dedicated, you, you, know, you know, dedicated help on long-term planning, dedicated help on financial. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, we did it as, as, as well as we could do it for as long as we could do it. And it became a point where we were, we had to, it, it had to grow to stay alive. Got it. 
And is that when you started looking at other ways to, uh, you know, I guess I'll call it grow the business? Well, we were, we, yeah, it just became very gradually over the years. Uh, I had, I had a lot of ideas and a lot of ambitions. And then I had a, like a very fortuitous, um, early, early on, I had no idea what I was doing. I, I didn't have any kind of blueprint, right? I would yeah. like, <laughs> I, would, I would wake up and do what made sense that day. Yeah. And a, a choice, a, something might present itself and it, and it wasn't like choose A or choose B. Oftentimes it was just choose this or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you know, now like I've gotten to a point and because of people I work with and, you know, I'm surrounded by a lot of expertise, but, uh, and I don't, when I say me, I don't mean me, but our company has gotten to the point now where we do have, we, we do view the world as choosing between option A, option B, option C, right? What are we going to do? What most excites us, right? And yeah, what what will have to sit and wait? Um, what are we going to, what seems like a fun idea, but in the end, we're not going to do it because we'd rather prioritize this other thing. For the first many years, for the first five years of Meat Eater, there was, it was not that way. It was just every day trying to like just make things happen, you know, w without long-term strategy. So it wasn't, I eventually met had like through a fortuitous thing. I eventually met people who were very interested in nascent, like emerging digital media properties. Yeah. And I had yeah. never, at the time I thought like, we're like a, like a hunting brand. I never, you know, a hunting brand that had a lot of, you know, that had a lot of interest in fishing as well. I never thought to be like, I never thought to look at it from this outside perspective, like, oh, we're a digital, like, we're a digital media company. It didn't even click. Like, I, I never thought, like, I want to build a digital media company. I wanted to, like, work in hunting. Like, I wanted to make stuff about hunting. <laughs> By making stuff about hunting, we were making a podcast. We were making television shows. We were making books. We were doing social media. We were doing YouTube videos. Um, we were doing integrated brand partnership things. We were doing everything. And like everything that a digital media company does, but I never, it never occurred to me that we had become a digital media company. I get it. Yeah. And then also one day I'm like, oh, there's a name for that? <laughs> Some people start with that in mind. <laughs> oh, that, that's why I, I like, I, I laugh about all the time. And, um, and, and, and even, you know, like we, we, the, the the companies we've you know the acquisitions we've done have been all founder based companies okay they yeah they, yeah it's like people that started out doing shit in their garages right and 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 like FHF gear the founder Paul Lewis he was a policeman and he was annoyed you know by things he was annoyed by the visor organizer in his patrol car yeah. He was like annoyed by like ways to carry things. Um, guys in the, in the tactical fields were like, "Hey, can you sew me of this yeah. so I can put my magazines in it?" Whatever the hell, right? Yep. And, it, and he like he never thought I'm gonna build a a hunting accessory company that that covers X, Y, and Z. He was just was one day making this, and the next day he's making that, the next day he's making the next thing, you know felt's game calls he would like to call elk and he started taking calls apart and being like how the hell did they make that and why didn't they make it this way and then you know then it becomes a thing um but yeah i we we sort of i guess we accidentally made a digital media company and then i learned to realize that we had made an end of it then i came to realize we had made an end of it a digital media company um and there was like a passionate audience for it and there was more demand for the there was more demand for the kind of stuff we produced than there was supply of what we were producing right we could make more and do more things in more spaces and yeah. then i start yeah. i finally came to see what we had made as being like a, a thing of value to people that didn't care about to people that don't necessarily care about hunting and fishing like we, we like built a media company 
but I never, ever, ever thought I'd build a media company. I used to be, I used to wish the internet would go away <laughs> because I was good at, re I was good at library research and I thought I had a competitive advantage because I was a good fast reader and I understood what I read. And when the internet came out, I was annoyed because it made it that anybody could go find stuff out. And now I, they're abolishing the Dewey decimal <laughs> system. <laughs> I wanted it to go away, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <clears throat> careful now you're going to start getting called a geezer real soon with an attitude oh, like that I, I embrace it now right like <laughs> i had a set of things i wanted to talk about and 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 i originally pictured talking about them in magazine articles and i pictured yeah. talking books and now i don't care like whatever medium it hasn't been invented yet when it comes out i'll be like great let's talk about it that way now too well, that's, I mean, that's, you know, page 14 in every TV contract I've ever signed. You know, we're going to buy all this oh. stuff from you. And then if they ever invent you, some other kind of media, we still own it all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but I used to live in fear of that shit, man. I remember yeah. living in fear. Of what, I remember just everything. I Like, I, I, I went to graduate school to study nonfiction writing. Yeah. It was right as the dot-com you know like i sold my first piece right before the dot-com crash happened mm -hmm. and i fear of like i loved writing you know i loved big glossy magazines man i love books and i thought that that digital was a attack on that i just had i didn't come to see it all the right way yet like i see it now you know, and I don't know what makes that shift. I guess for some of us, it's out of necessity. For others, it's just been part of their life since they were nine. Yeah, I, I think for me it was, a uh, man, I don't know. I think it was a little begrudging yeah. out of necessity until I came to see the power of it. Well, you know, you, you, hit, a, you hit on it right there, and that's exactly right. It is... Um, by default or something it is you can't ignore it now you just can't afford to ignore it yeah and um it's a tremendous way to you know there's a lot of ways to communicate and, and i like it that we communicate to people in so many of these ways including yeah. still doing traditional book publishing yeah which you is know, we have, spectacular we have, we have a contract for even more titles from mm -hmm. you know from penguin random house right yeah. so so i'm doing that thing that that i dreamed of still but but i've just become more agnostic about i've become agnostic about what form it takes because i'm more in i realize that i'm more interested in the ideas than i yeah. am and admitted i get it and it's so true uh absolutely um and and by the way, that reminds me, speaking of books and all of that, um, Megan Stencil, who's who's put this, mainly put all of this together so we could talk, she's been very helpful. And I think she works primarily on your book side, but whatever it was, she, she did a good job. She, she's one to keep. Oh, yeah. She, no, that's that's Megan with uh, Random House, correct? Uh, no, with the agency. Oh, she's with, she's with, um, she's with Javelin? Yes. Oh, I'm okay. sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yep. Anyway, Frank. she did a good yep. job for what it's worth. Um, I appreciate that. No, um, Javelin dudes, man. I, I love those guys. Yeah. We're, we're, we actually became Keith, who's the main main figure there. We're, yeah. uh, we've become friends over the years and have, I bet. you know, spent some time together. Yeah. Well, you better get along. You got what? Five more books under contract, I think. <laughs> we got, yeah, we got some projects, man. Well, good for you. Um, so let's let's have some fun here. What of all the things you do? What do you enjoy the most? Uh, whether it's a, an act of hunting or an act of communication or content creation, what if you had to narrow it down to your top three or four? What would it be? You mean you mean work wise, correct? Uh, yeah, yeah. I get no <laughs> one in each. Well, let's uh, I'll, one I'll category you, for each. I'll give you two answers yeah. then. Um, I, if, if there has been a, like, I've been incredibly lucky and I have a, a, a really great, uh, I have a great career, right? Mm -hmm. um, I get to write about and talk about things that I love. 
Um, mm-hmm. and, and that's phenomenal. If it's come at a cost, it's come at a cost of, of the time I've spent away from my family. That's the great compromise. Okay. Yeah. What makes that palatable, what makes that livable is that we're also able to spend some really great time absolutely together. Okay. Um, I could see that if I had whatever become a lawyer at some high power law firm and I didn't travel, but I was working 12 hours a day and I would catch my kids, you know, working Saturdays, whatever. And I would catch my kids for bedtime. Right. Yep. I feel like, Hey, I'm always there every night. I'm there for 30 minutes and we have bedtime together. And that's great. Um, I don't do that, but I spend good chunks of very quality time with my family. Yeah. Um, the time I feel most at peace, even though they frustrate the hell out of me sometimes, <laughs> the time I feel most at peace is when I can be out hunting and fishing with my kids because I'm, I'm honoring my family. Yeah. I'm there for them in the biggest way possible. And I'm honoring my passion, right? So that to me is the most sort of like guilt-free, just enjoyable, prideful moments is being able to spend time outside with my kids, even though half the time I'm yelling them by, at them about going over their boots in the water. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I do. Yeah, I was a scout leader. <laughs> stop, stop having that BB gun, yeah. like pointing oh, at my left. So, um, that's a favorite. In, in terms of the, in terms of of working, man, um, it's the most fun for me to record. Like, I really enjoy recording our podcasts because I'm interviewing people. And hanging out with people that I've wanted to hang out with and talk to. Yeah. Um, the thing I, the thing that's most re- rewarding for me long term is writing, even though I don't like, you know, I don't really know anybody that likes the, actually like enjoys the process of writing, like physically doing it, right? I like thinking about it. Physically doing it, I, I, I don't, I can't say that I enjoy that. I um, yeah. Yeah. It's not, that's not what it's about. You know what I mean? Right. It's, it's like yeah. you're not enjoying the moment. You just, you're, you're very, you're proud of what you did and you're glad you did it. And and if I was gonna, you know, if I was gonna, if I died right and I was going to have like my tombstone and I could have something written on it, I would never want TV host or podcast host. Like I would want the, I would want someone to chisel the word writer in there. I hear you. Um, yeah. And, and that's the thing that gr- gives me the greatest long-term sense of fulfillment but just for fun in the moment, doing the podcast is a lot of fun to me. Oh, I agree. I mean, uh, in the best podcasts I do are the ones where I have a couple friends and we just riff. Yep. It's fun. <laughs> yeah, we laugh our asses off, right? It's great. And then, and like I said, you get to like spend time with people that you wanted to spend time with and interview them. Precisely. So. Yeah. Um, you know, most people know you as a guy who gets to hunt on TV and boy, you're so lucky because you just show up and you walk around and you shoot stuff, then you go eat it. What a job. We all know that's not what it is, but in terms of the hunting itself, uh, what's on the bucket list that you haven't checked off yet? I, I used to have thoughts like that. Yeah. I don't now. Um, I've, I've, I, I'd like at this point, I want to do more of the things that I know I love to do. Yeah. You know, I, I used to have a real just drive, you know, to, to like, Oh man, I want to go do this new thing. I want to go that new thing. Now I'm like, I know that I like to hunt spring turkeys. Uh huh. I know that I like to go to our fish shack and, chase halibut and salmon and lingcod and shrimp and crab. And I love that. Uh, I like to hunt mule deer in the snow, right. In the rut. Um, I like to bow hunt for elk, man. I love that. Uh, there's some things like 
I, I, I really like, you know, it's funny as my sort of international ambitions right at this point are uh, a Capra Cali. Oh, yeah. Like a big bird. Come on, <laughs> so we're trying to arrange to go do that. Um, we had a trip fall through for oscillated turkeys. Because well, I've got. All, what, I've way got, down? Costa Rica or somewhere, right? Yeah, yeah. And then, and then uh, that, that'll make me, which is, like, my wife laughs about this, but that would make me a, a world slam a turkey world slam holder yeah yeah so but you didn't like know had, that until someone else pointed it out right yeah, exactly yeah good for the good part, man, all right <laughs> if i could go if i could at this point hit rewind and just go relive yeah moments that i blew and have a second chance at things that i blew opportunity shot opportunities fish i lost not knots i should have tied better like <laughs> right like i'd be like that sounds like a great plan man i would i would be quite content just to go and redo that shit um but but there's some things that 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 i'm also there's some things that i really like that i'm very I, i'm i'm excited to show my kids yeah you know but i don't have i'll continue to do new stuff but i don't i'm, I'm not that that's not what gets me out anymore it's like i'm I know what I like, and I just, I want to do more of what I like in more places. Yeah, um, which is not too far, especially when you mention your kids, from almost the pat answer I get from, from experienced hunters and anglers when I interview them, especially leaders in, in the industries. Um, you, you ask what they like most about hunting or fishing, and they say, showing other people how to do it. Sure, man. I'm, I love doing it, but I'm there. Yeah. Uh, and, and it doesn't mean that there's, it doesn't mean that there's a decreased enthusiasm. It's just yeah. fun. Yeah. And I did a lot of things pretty young and, um, don't have that recollection about that. But the fact that my daughter, she'll be old enough. She's got a couple turkeys already out of state. Yeah. Which old enough to hunt deer in her home state of Montana next year. And she's excited about it. And I'm telling you, if I was, if someone said you can do one, you can hunt, you can do one trip next year, one hunting trip next year. I mean, there is not, without even thinking about the answer, the answer is this. It would be that, that we go out for youth deer, that I go for youth deer season with my daughter. Like, end of story. That is the one thing. Um and I got enough faith in her that I think we'd still be eating venison. So I love it. Well, good on you and good luck on that one. So you ha basically you have a CEO, a wonderful CEO named Dan Chumbler who came to us over from Polaris. Oh, I thought that name sounded a little familiar. Yep. Was he in marketing there? No, he okay. ran a pretty, he ran a very he ran a very big business there, but no, he was. You, okay. you'll, I'm sure you'll you'll be you'll get a chance to talk to him. Yeah. He can give you the layout, but uh, you know he ran a he ran a large part of the a, a big part of Polaris. Okay, all right. I, I I just the name is a little bit unusual, so you remember things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when we were looking for a CEO, um, he he was great man we were engaged in interview processes and uh and he kind of he came he found his way in through a sort of i don't want to say a back channel but but he was persistent and then i got on the phone with him and in 30 minutes i knew that i was like man this guy is you know um this guy's the guy for the job and, he, and he's been great and he's seen us through uh, he's seen us through quite a bit Great. when we entered into the, when, when, when our first CEO left me and my colleague, Tracy Crane, um, assumed like a, a co-leadership role, the two of us. And sure. it was right when the pandemic hit. I mean, what a nightmare, man. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and we were lucky to get, we were, we were lucky to get Dan. And, and so Dan, you know, between our, our operations in Washington, Idaho, um, Belgrade, Montana, Bozeman, Montana. Uh, Dan oversees everything. Nice. Yeah, I'd like to talk with him. Um, get a couple comments. 
uh, about you. So there, watch out. So, uh, so now I want you to put your TV host uh, camouflage hat on and, and, and give readers a little bit of hunting advice. Could be anything about anything, about anywhere. But if you were to give readers advice about their own hunting and maybe beyond that, how to watch hunting television shows, what would you tell them? <laughs> I don't know. Man, the last thing I would ever do is give them advice about how to watch hunting television yeah. shows. And I'll tell you part of why uh-huh. is the home. I don't watch too many, yeah. so I'm not a great guy to ask. <laughs> but, uh, and, I, and I'll tell you why. Uh, it's not. It, uh, it's only for one reason. I am. <laughs> I'm. I, I. I'm very. I'm very careful about what I allow into my brain. Um, and I have always tried to find my inspirations in places that are far removed from my particular genre. Yeah. Because I have a fear of, um, that I would be influenced by my peers and become and, just like them. And I, that, that, that I would like mistake that I would be having their ideas somehow thinking that they were my ideas. And, and, you yeah. um, know, and so like as a, as a, creative strategy nothing else but just as a creative strategy i i i i try to like focus a lot of energy on on books film television from people i regard to be like cutting edge sort of in the discipline not in the genre not in my particular area I love it. Yeah. Where I come close to that is I read a lot of primary source material, historical primary source material. I'll read anything, any journal of any old trapper, any journal of any old market hunter, right? Yeah. Read accounts of, 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 in, of bo- people being on the ground doing things in bygone times. I'll read that all day long. Yeah but I don't read a lot of contemporary material that deal really directly with what I deal with because I just, uh, it just, I, I don't like to work that way, but it's not yeah. a condemnation. It's not a condemnation of anything. I remember when it used to, I, I used to be confused a little bit where people would look at me eater and think that it was somehow um, meant to be a commentary on hunting TV or, or, or you know, meant to be like that it was somehow informed in some way by hunting TV. But, but the people that I was, that that's not what I was watching. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and the people that I was making the show with, uh, people that had a huge impact on what the show looked like, like Mo Fallon, Nick Brigden, Jared Andrew Canis. These are all ZPZ guys. Okay. That I'm still very close with. So Morgan Fallon. Nick Brigden, B R I G D E N, Jared Andrew Canis, who's still with ZPZ. They had no, they didn't know anything about hunting. Yeah. But they knew about like, they knew about story, right? And they, they knew how, they knew their craft, man. They knew cinematography, right? They, 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 like, they knew how to capture, they knew how to capture exciting moments. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that was where we were coming from. And so later when I would hear, like when I, when, when we started doing media and I'd hear from people that, that they thought that I was, you know, I, I was never commenting on someone else's work. It, it was not that what it was just, it was what I was interested in, how I was interested in. It. That's all it was meant to be. Um, and, and I, and I, and I still do that. I still do that now. I'm a, I will read, you know, I, I read pretty much everything that was ever written by Jim Harrison because he's from my home state. Jim Harrison was a very avid hunter and angler, right? But he was a novelist, and I'll read his work. But I don't yeah. focus a lot on I, – I, I don't focus on materials put out by who I would regard to be my peers. Wow. 
I hope you learned as much about the Meat Eater organization and Steve Rinella the man as I did when I was putting this together for Hook and Barrel magazine. If you like this kind of stuff, let me know. I might be able to do more of these with some of the folks who I'm writing about periodically. So keep me posted at the Upland Nation or the Wing Shooting USA Facebook pages. The Upland Nation podcast is brought to you in part by Pointer Shotguns. Learn more about them at PointerShotguns.com. Watch for that brand new side-by-side. Maybe it's time for you to try a gun that's configured to your eyes. Or if you want to start a new hunter, there's a large number of um, what I'll call entry-level shotguns. It's all at PointerShotguns.com, where you can find a nearby retailer, browse all the models, take a look at some of the videos and articles there. It's all available at PointerShotguns.com. And with that, it's time to close. Thank you for your kind attention today, especially on this extra long version of the Upland Nation podcast. Thanks to everybody who comments at the social platforms, those who left ratings and reviews. We're all made possible by Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products, Pointer Shotguns, Mid Valley Clays, and True Lock Chokes. Thanks to Steve Ranella for his time and his, um, I guess I'll call it his inspiration. And most of all, thank you for listening here at the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden. Thanks again. See you down the road.